And so they uh, do so under the guise, again, somewhat uh, delightfully referentially, as both being Ernest is their name. Welcome to No Script, an unscripted conversation about theater's best scripts. I'm Jacob Mann Christensen. And I am Jackson Nikolai. Welcome back, everyone. We've returned from another of our journeys together. We have. We are on the back end of our themed month. Themed month is a long-standing tradition on No Script. I think we've said enough about it in the past five weeks, but if you haven't listened to any of those episodes, please go back and check them out. We had a delightful time talking about four short plays. We were able to look at really power-packed pieces of theater that just fit into a smaller time frame that maybe need uh, a partner to make a full evening of theater, quote, unquote, whatever that means. Um, That was our second time talking about short plays. Each time we've discovered really stellar pieces of theater, and that's just one of the really cool things that Themed Month allows you to do, I think. Yeah, yeah, it was a super great month to get to refocus on different form of theater, talk a little bit more about form, not just about, we of course had our kind of normal conversations around plot and character and all that sort of thing, but also got to have the conversation around theater in a short form and all that it can do. Super great time, definitely go check it out, the last four episodes, if you're listening to them, if you happen to cross this podcast, or this episode of the podcast just out of the blue, the last four ones were the themed month. Um, but now we're now we're back into kind of the uh, last half of the season and back to our regular regularly scheduled programming. Um, and we're talking today about uh, it's it's a little winds up being a little bit of a 180 from the scripts we were we were uh, talking about before because a lot of them had to do with uh, a lot of drama, a lot of kind of significant moments. Um, but uh, this one uh, definitely brings brings the comedy punch into the equation. That's right. Yeah. Today's play is it's it is so um, weighted towards being like witty, speedy comedy. It is it's so heavily weighted towards that that it can only be a sequel to the other incredibly famous English. I mean, not, not that there's not a lot of them, but the one that you think of when you say like witty, speedy comedies of manners. Yeah. And of course, that play is the importance of being earnest. And today's play is a sequel to the importance of being earnest. Yeah, the uh, uh, importance of being earnest part do uh, thoroughly stupid things by Montserrat Mendez um, is the thoroughly play that we're talking about Thoroughly stupid things is an excellent title. I try not to do the title (laughs) thing like every episode because I know it only matters somewhat and it has a lot to do with marketing and and all of that. But if you've listened to the podcast more than just one or two episodes, you've probably heard I love the craft of titling. I'm kind of a snob about titles. I have some kind of specific ideas about what they do and how they work. Thoroughly Stupid Things is an excellent title. It is. It's a, it is in in just its kind of initial grab ya attention sort of way. It's also great because it's a quote from Oscar Wilde. Um, uh, and uh, so, yeah, it, it has all sorts of kind of referential stuff, which the play has just loads and loads of referential stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, it catches your attention and brings you in to what is the, like the characters go on almost farcical levels of kind of. Uh, not almost, on farcical levels of kind of stupid endeavors. So it makes sense that this play gets the uh, thoroughly stupid things as the title because these characters just go on a wild ride in this script. Yeah, you know, the importance of being earnest is part of its uh, staggering legacy is that it is a really classic example of a particular kind of comedy, the comedy of manners. And you would, I think, maybe expect the follow-up 
play to really try to be in that same genre. And I, I don't know Monster at Mendez or, or really what he was intending or whatnot, but this play feels like it has stepped into something else. Uh, you know, you use the word farce. I, you know, I, I would call it maybe a costume comedy or a, um, a, a theater event kind of comedy. We, we've talked before about a sequel on the podcast. We talked about Doll's House Part 2 by Lucas Nath. And I would say that I also believe that sequel is something that tries to do something different than the original play did. It's not trying to be another play of the same type. So th- this this that I'm offering about Thoroughly Stupid Things is not a criticism. I, this is, if you're going to write a sequel, m- you know, 100 or more years later from the original script, hopefully you are trying to do something different than the original right. play. <laughs> Otherwise, you are writing very much out of time. But I, I mean, this play feels a, like a, maybe a, maybe a way I would say it is it feels like a bigger comedy than the importance of being earnest does in some ways yeah yeah bigger yeah definitely it kind of like vamps up takes the theme and get turn turns a crank to 11 or or kind of moves it into moves it into kind of a a bigger scope yeah yeah definitely i'm excited to get to talk about it there's a a lot of kind of fun beats of it and it'll be a great conversation however before we jump into that conversation we want to take a moment and say thank you to all of our patrons over at patreon.com slash no script podcast. Now, if you've listened to the show at all, you've heard us talk about this before. We love getting to do this show. This is like every week we get to sit down, read a play, have these conversations, and then extend the conversation out to all of you out there in podcast land. And the patrons at patreon.com slash no script podcast make that happen. So thank you all so much for for being patrons of the show. And if you're looking for a way to get involved in the NoScript community a little bit more, if you like what you're hearing, if you like our themed months or our special guest episodes, or just the wide uh, uh, array of scripts that we uh, bring into the into our conversations, uh, Patreon is a great way to do that. You'll get access to patron only posts over there. You'll get access to the scripts ahead of time. There's a number of different tiers of membership. So you can uh, shop anywhere from like $1 to like $15, I think is the highest one we have over there right now, something like that. Um, and at that $1 amount, you're helping out the show immensely. Um, and uh, so, so if you're looking for a way to be a part of the community a little bit more, if you're looking for a way to help out the show, head on over to patreon.com slash no script podcast, and we will see you over there. Thank you, thank you to everybody who supports the show on Patreon. You make doing this show possible. And now, back to the script. All right, here we go. Hey, yes, okay, so we're back from our uh, themed month journeys, and we're back into sort of our traditional episode format. This is a new playwright to the podcast, Montserrat Mendez, which means we will offer just a brief look into his life. Um, Montserrat Mendez, uh, also known as Mozzie, works out of New Jersey, uh, refers to himself as a writer-director out of New Jersey. He's originally from Puerto Rico um, and has done a lot of his work in New York City um, in kind of the off-off-Broadway scene there. Got his degree from the University of Scranton um, and then kind of went on to do a, a lot of things with independent theater companies uh, in New York City. We're looking at places like the Manhattan Theater Source, the Nylon Fusion Collective. He also went on and founded his own theater company, the Mazel Company, um, and from that point has that has sort of been the jumping off point for some of the writing that he's done. He's also a screenwriter um, and a film director as well. Uh, this play, Thoroughly Stupid Things, is uh, his first play, his first full-length play. He started out, he claims, uh, the, the story goes, sort of writing for the, his friends' uh, little one-act scenes that they would perform, and that kind of grew into a full-length play. After this play, he went on and wrote a play called Billy Carver and the Children in Mind, which also premiered at the Manhattan Theater Source. Um, and, and between this play and that play, he got a lot of buzz as sort of a young uh, an artist to keep an eye on, uh, was how nytheater.com put it. His writing partner, Armistead Johnson, uh, and he are doing a fair amount of TV and film writing as they can find it. 
this play, again, to go sort of then backwards in time, uh, was his first full-length play, as I said. It premiered in 2008 uh, in New York City and then had a production later in the year at the New York International Fringe Festival. And between those two productions, it got a fair amount of buzz. It, it was uh, really well reviewed by a number of different publications, including Backstage Magazine. Um, and then uh, Montserrat Mendez often puts in his uh, bios, it seems, uh, that he is an award winning playwright. I believe that largely comes from the Excellence in Playwriting Award that this play received at the uh, 2008 New York International Friends Festival. He has uh, also written another full-length play to jump back forward in time, which is an all-male contemporary adaption of uh, Les Liaisons Dangerous, uh, which he titles Mark as Unread. Um, he Again, he, he's doing a lot, I think, of the TV film writing nowadays. His, his IMDb page continues to be more and more filled out. Um, he's a partner in a production company called AMZ Creative um, and is developing uh, commercial, sort of a, a way in which to succeed commercially in the off-off-Broadway movement. Um, and so he, he has a little quip that he promised to, to write one full-length play a year for 10 years. So his library of plays sort of continues to grow and grow. Um, there, there's a lovely quote that he says about his writing uh, that, that I just found a, a nice way to think about playwriting. I'm not sure how much it'll uh, uh, sort of apply forward to our conversation. So it seems apt to give now as we talk about this playwright specifically. This is how he describes uh, writing. He says, I prefer to use storytelling as a form of archaeology, exploring the various evolutions of character, language, and wit, and how they form our human identity, how stories are used for the erasure of cultures, and how they can be utilized for our reemergence into a more equitable future. So there's just a little bit about Montserrat Mendez and thoroughly stupid things, um, and we will... We'll, potentially be able to sort of refer back to that beginnings in the uh, New York off-off Broadway movement, its success in the Fringe Festival, as a way of kind of understanding what this script is uh, and the life that it has had. Yeah, yeah, yes, indeed. It's 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 been a yeah super fun script. I imagine really great for actors to get the chance to kind of jump into and dig into <laughs> these uh re really great comedic scenes. A lot of great timing work in it. So yeah, excited to jump into that conversation. Before we do, as is our practice, I will give you a short synopsis of uh, this play. This is a great play. It has lots of interwoven uh, storylines. A lot of different people pursuing different plots. So I'm going to give you the brief the brief version of of this of uh, all of their their machinations as we jump into this play now this play uh obviously uh has a lot of familiar characters in it uh if you're familiar with the importance of being earnest but i'll real quick run down the list here we have gwendolyn who is married to jack cecily who is married to algernon we have lady bracknell who is oh i think uh if i'm trying to remember i think she's algernon's godmother and jack's mother um, uh, but that's and, like uh, a that, twist reveal at the end of Importance of Being right. Honest, I think. Yep, at the at the end of the play, she's revealed as connected to both of them. We have Miss Prism, who uh, was Jack's nursemaid who lost him at a train station back in Importance of Being Earnest. She, at the end of Importance of Being Earnest, was kind of quickly um, affianced to Chausable, the, uh, the the priest. Um, and uh, uh, th though we quickly figure out that didn't turn out all that well. Um, uh, then we have uh, two new characters uh, in this play. We have Inspector Rainier, Inspector Franco Rainier, who is a French inspector. Inspector, we'll get to him in a, in a little bit in Act Two. And then we also have Bibi La Flamme, um, and uh, she uh, it will also emerge in in Act Two as well. So be on the lookout for those names. The play begins with uh, Gwendolyn and Cecily, I believe. I, I, I am comfortable making the guess it's like 10 ish years later. Um, uh, the, like uh, do this mostly based on the fact that Cecily is aged in her late twenties. And I'm guessing since she was still the ward of Jack in the importance of being earnest, she was quite young in importance of being earnest. So 
I'm I'm going to say I'm guessing 10 years after the events of Importance of Being Earnest and marriage is not going well for these characters. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Gwendolyn and Cecily are kind of at home and uh, bemoaning the uh, state of their marriages, which uh, involve Jack and Algernon somewhat predictably, if you know these characters being off gallivanting at their club or in London, always late to return home, not being very attentive to their wives and uh, Gwendolyn and Cecily kind of uh, very, um, very bored <laughs> with their estate life. Um, uh, they, they mention quite a bit about all the things that they try to do to keep themselves busy, but to no avail um, and uh, some angst building against their husbands for that. Into this scene steps Miss Prism. Miss Prism uh, is uh, writing a book, writing a novel. It's a follow-up to another novel that she wrote that uh, was probably pretty self-referential. We're pretty sure that uh, she, she, a lot of her lines have to do with uh, very self-referential stuff around like, what if I wrote a play about the goings-on of my life? Um, and so she's trying to develop that play. She steps into the scene and is kind of accosted by Gwendolyn and Cecily, who are looking for um, some some sort of way to uh to to pass the time um and then into the scene steps lady bracknell as well uh lady bracknell again is the the mother and the godmother of the of jack and algernon she steps into the scene and they all kind of share a bit of uh lament at how the men are off and about in a way in a scene uh, where uh, Gwendolyn and Cecily step away for a moment, we also get a moment aside with Lady Bracknell and Miss Prism, and Miss Prism confesses that she is, uh, uh, amongst her, her tasks and her writing of the book, she is uh, also the nanny of uh, the two couple's children, and uh, she somewhat predictably for her character has misplaced those children. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, lost them in London somewhere. Can't find them. It's been weeks. <laughs> she can't. She can't locate them. Um, Lady Bracknell says, "I suspected as much." Um, I'll help you find them, but let's keep uh, Gwendolyn and Cecily distracted as we try to find these grandchildren of hers. So they come back into the room, and a pretty important revelation is is uh, made. Uh, Gwendolyn has received a note from uh, Jack and Algernon's club. Um, which uh, is thanking them for uh, finding a new talent for them in Miss Bibi La Flemme. Um, <clears throat> she is a kind of lounge singer and and in, a, in an interesting device, which will come in in act two, uh, their club's rule is that you have to speak in rhyme the whole time. Um, so the message is kind of given to them in rhyme and kind of talks about how the club is grateful for them for finding this young talent for them and that it's really stirring things up. Um, again, this is all a gentleman's club. And so uh, 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 Bibi La Flemme is there singing. Uh, she's a French singer. And... Uh, the, the note continues uh, with some uh, somewhat uh, revealing comments about how Jack and Algernon behave at the club, specifically that they tell stories about their wives and the goings on of both Gwendolyn and Cecily, probably not in a flattering light. Um, and so Cecily and Gwendolyn uh, discern somewhat, somewhat uh, succinctly that they are in some degree of an affair with Bibi La Flemme. Um, so they hatch a plot. They hatch a plot to go uh, to the club in uh, different, uh, in the guise of men. Actually, uh, Lady Bracknell helps them discern this. I think C Cecily wants to just run on in and start swinging punches. Um, but Lady Bracknell's like, no, 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 we'll dress you up as men. You'll go in as, as people of the club and you can spy on them and ascertain for sure that they are being unfaithful to you. Um, and so they uh, do so under the guise Again, somewhat uh, delightfully referentially as both being earnest is their name. Uh, uh, so they, they show up, they get the uh, recommendation of Chausable to go in uh, as, as these members and they go to the club. That's act one, pretty much. So you can sort of see what Mendez is doing with the original importance of Ernest being Ernest story already, right? He's setting up a situation in the next play in which Gwendolyn and Cecily can be the ones who pretend to be Ernest, rather than, of course, in the famous original play, Jack and Algernon separately pretend to be a man named Ernest. Interestingly, in that play, they're both pretending to be the same man, and in this play, Gwendolyn and Cecily are pretending to be brothers who happen to both be named Ernest. But in, in general, that that is what Mendez has done as the kind of 
concept for this play, I would guess. If I were a guessing man, that's where this started, right? If I'm going to write a follow-up, let's craft a situation in which Gwendolyn and Cecily pretend to be Ernest rather than Jack and Algernon. Yeah, it's a good good riff, kind of a reversal, and uh, and and in in you jump to a, a new sort of arc of this earnest kerfuffle. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so act, act two begins and they go to the club. The, the, the act starts with a song from uh, Bibi La Flemme. And I'm just going to read you her character description real quick. 20s, gorgeous, seductive, black, French lounge singer, a la Josephine Baker. Great chanteuse and dancer, played by a black man, French accented. So... Uh, uh, BB is kind of singing this song and, and, uh, she wraps up and kind of goes out to the tables and starts talking with people at the club. Jack and Algernon are there. Um, and, uh, and again, this whole scene pretty much happens in rhyme. Uh, they, they have to like speak, speak in a couplets, uh, every single line. So they continue, they flirt with BB for a little while. Um, and, uh, she flirts back and there's this kind of repartee between them. Eventually though, Chasuble comes in and and uh, sees them there uh, and introduces the two uh, Ernests into the group, which, of course, are Gwendolyn and Cecily. What follows is a, a kind of long back and forth, lots of foibles, lots of uh, Cecily struggling with the rhyming pairs, um, uh, lots of the the uh, kind of back and forth. They notice uh, certainly the flirting uh, between uh, Jack and Algernon and BB, but also Algernon starts to flirt with uh, Cecily, who he believes is Ernest, who he believes is a man. Um, and uh, uh, later on, he will have a revelation to the to the cast that he is by. So there's there's all sorts of flirting going on at this table. What eventually emerges is BB accusing uh, them of their marriage, married lives and saying, surely your wives aren't being faithful to you back at home. So it's totally fine to have an affair. Um, they're, they're surely off and engaging in their own affairs over there. Jack and Algernon are like, no, of course not. They dote on us because we have double standards. Um, and <laughs> and uh, so they, they, they say, we're going to be heading home. We'll, we'll all go home and we'll be, sh we'll, I, we're telling you, they're going to be in the lounge. They're going to be talking to our mom, our godmother and, and uh, everything's going to be fine. They'll be drinking tea. You're, you'll be so wrong. They're devoted to us. Blah, 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 blah. This, of course, is, is said right in front of Gwendolyn and Cecily as Ernest and Ernest. So they quickly devise, begin devising their plan for escaping this gotcha moment. They all return home. Home, by the way, uh, this is Act 3. Home, by the way, is currently occupied by uh, Lady Bracknell and Chausable, who is tied up to a chair, um, and she is trying to get Chausable to marry him, uh, marry her. Uh, so, so, uh, a delightful little B-plot going on <laughs> with them there. <laughs> Um, uh, uh, so Chasuble is tied up for the majority of the scene, which will come up later, maybe. Um, but eventually everyone starts to roll back in. Miss Prism is there as well. And the whole crew rolls up and is and Jack's like, where are our wives? They're not in this room. Miss Prism, go find them. Miss Prism, which she will do many times, exits the room and almost immediately comes back in and says, I can't find them anywhere. Um, I've, look, I've looked through the whole house. She uh, obviously is in on the plot. So she sees Ernest and Ernest there. She knows that Gwendolyn and Cecily are in the room. And then what proceeds is just a uh, just an over and over sort of. Gwendolyn and Cecily step out of the room, become Ernest and Ernest and come back into the room and then step out of the room and become Gwendolyn and Cecily. Back and forth it goes. Um, eventually, oh, an important character who I forgot to mention in Act 2 is our dear Inspector Rainier, who emerges into the into the club to say that he's uh, looking for a kidnapper, essentially. Um he is uh, uh, trying to search out this kidnapper. As soon as he shows up to the house, he falls madly in love with uh, Miss Prism. Um, however, uh, as he reveals more and more about this uh, this person that he's trying to find, uh, they begin to suspect that this person has kidnapped their children, which uh, <laughs> Miss Prism takes advantage of and says, oh yeah, they definitely, definitely kidnapped the children. Um, this happens in a scene when Ernest and Ernest are out of the room, uh, when Gwendolyn and Cecily are in the room, and so they all suspect Ernest and Ernest, and so uh, Gwendolyn and Cecily take it upon them to not besmirch the name of Ernest and Ernest and so try to clear their name by a series of one of them being dressed up as Ernest talking to the other and back and forth and back and forth that goes until finally they get caught uh, with one of them as Ernest I believe Gwendolyn as Ernest and Cecily can't get out of her dress in time to become the other Ernest so Gwendolyn is trying to help Cecily get out of the dress 
and uh, as one of the earnests gets caught in the act, looks very, very uh, 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 compromising. And it's, so it's actually a fairly shocking sex joke <laughs> at that moment. In the show. very early in the play, Cecily, apparently she's like kind of a kleptomaniac. She steals all throughout the play. We'll maybe <laughs> talk about that. Very early in the play, she's stolen a knife and fork. It's like the first thing that it's the only thing required that she steals. So she has that. So she's like under the dress, under Gwendolyn's dress, trying to help Gwendolyn get the dress off and everybody walks in and she comes back out from under the dress holding the knife and fork right dressed yeah. as her <laughs> it's uh yep. i would call that a fairly brash sex joke <laughs> <laughs> yep yep for sure um <laughs> Algernon immediately challenges Gwendolyn to a duel. Gwendolyn, Gwendolyn dressed up as Ernest, of course. They go into a duel. Um, they they uh, fight to oh, the right. death. Oh, right. I've got them backwards. Algernon kills It's him. actually that Gwendolyn yes. f- finds the knife and fork that Cecily stole hidden in Cecily's dress. And that's in why she comes dress. out yes, with yes, the yes, knife yes. and fork. Because she's like, look, why have you stolen this? So that, I got it backwards. So it's Gwendolyn who comes out with the knife and fork, even though Cecily's the one that stole him. It's, st- it's the exact same sex joke, just the opposite people. It's the same joke. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So eventually Gwendolyn is is struck uh, struck with the sword and uh, goes down uh, at this point the the whole ruse is kind of owned up to by uh, those in the room including Miss Prism who comes clean um and and Gwendolyn Gwendolyn dies. <laughs> Gwendolyn like, has a, a rather slow the world death of scene. The play, <laughs> I think she actually dies, right? I think so. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah. She dies, uh, dies from the sword blow, and then also because she dies so many times in a row, eventually Jack like chokes her to death. Um, so <laughs> again, like a, a kind of shocking moment of of physical comedy <laughs> towards the end of the play. Um, and then uh, then it uh, kind of continues to uh, very similarly to the importance of being earnest quickly tie up the loose ends um uh you have uh you have uh, some foreshadowing has been developing that bb laflamme um is the kidnapper and kind of over and over there's these moments where it seems more and more likely that bb is in flat in fact the kidnapper and yet in the last kind of final moments it seems like she she's about to admit um uh that that she is and then lady bracknell jumps in <laughs> And says, I am, in fact, the kidnapper. I needed money and was trying to sell these kids of my, these grandkids. Um, uh, didn't, wasn't able to sell them off. It's apparently pretty hard to sell off children now in England. Um, and, uh, and so they, they kind of slowly, uh, devolve into this big argument. BB is revealed to be a man. She kind of takes off her wig. Um, and, and kind of on the, the, the accusations go, the admissions go. This sort of back and forth, uh, continues to, uh, uh, to uh, build to a cacophony, and the play ends with Gwendolyn coming back to life to kind of give a puck esque um, uh, uh, outro soliloquy or monologue about if we players have offended in any way, etc. Um, by 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 making this a sequel that you would watch and laugh at, then <laughs> here's the reasons why it's okay. And uh, the the play ends in this kind of merry melange cacophony of of all of the machinations of these characters kind of unraveling and spinning out uh, different, somewhat differently than than the uh, last time we saw the importance of being earnest, where all the machinations somehow neatly end in a bow with all, you know, the representative couples coupling up in the room. Yeah, th- this is going to be an interesting play to talk about. We've we've reflected on in the past that it is um, sometimes difficult for us to talk about comedies because we we try to have these maybe more in depth conversations uh, across the course of you know our forty five minutes to an hour episodes, and that comedies some so it's just hard to talk about humor in that way. And this play truly doesn't have much more to it then it's wit and it's comic timing and it's series of jokes and crazy situations. I, I'm not 
maybe I'm selling Mendez short in the, in his writing of the play, but I don't I don't see a lot of other commentary being made. There's maybe some uh, just based on the premise of the play in contrast to the premise of the importance of being earnest. There's maybe some gender politics kinds of arguments being made about you know this original play that the world reveres so greatly has these men you know sort of tricking these women. Well, what happens in our 21st century world if it's actually the women tricking the men? I, I don't know. Uh, that's probably in there to some degree. But I think a lot of this play is about the pure joy of laughter, being set up for a joke and having that joke pay off so well, uh, knowing that a ridiculous situation that you're in can only lead to further ridiculous situations and the just pleasant delight of watching that unfold. Yeah, yeah, I think I think the what what, what this uh what, one of the big things this play deals in is self-awareness. Um and and uh the degree to which it 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 it, it knows that it's a comedy. <laughs> and uh you're you're not looking for intensely deep motives. Of course, all of these characters are motivated by something and an actor and the and cast and, and production team should find what those motivations are. But uh but but the the fun of this play or the thing that you hang in there for this play is watching a complicated web slowly unravel in in a, in a comedic fashion. As opposed to a comedy of manners, which at least cer- certainly that that is there as well in a t- kind of typical comedy of manners where uh, you have these foibles going wrong, and it's funny because it's it's all they're being embarrassed in public, etc. But at the core of a comedy of manners is a critique of the structure in which the manners is based. You're laughing at this kind of uppity up family, um, and and them messing up so completely. Um, so so uh, this this play, I, I think there's some of that in there. I agree with what you said. There's there is a bit of a social commentary going on. Certainly, the reversal of having Gwendolyn and Cecily. Uh, jump into the roles of the the tricksters, um, and and some and and some of that speaks to a critique. Um, but it also is a very slapsticky, very uh, gotcha joke sort of play. I mean, there's a series of uh, gags basically where every time this group runs out of the room, the poor priest tied to the chair ends up like <laughs> crashing down the stairs off stage. I mean, it's just pure slapstick comedy. And I would say that, like, again, when when we started this part of the conversation way back before our usual Patreon plug and context and all that stuff, we talked about how if you're writing a sequel more than 100 years later, you should be doing something different. And it's it would be, I think, very hard to write a comedy of manners that is relevant for us today it's set in the time period of the importance of being earnest play, which this play sticks to. I could imagine a version of a importance of being earnest sequel that, you know, by some magic of storytelling is set in 2023 and that it is a comedy of manners about our time now. But that, that seems like an impossible task to ask when the premise is that it is set back in the time of the importance of being earnest. And I, I think you see Lucas Ney struggle with some of the same things in his Doll's House Part 2 sequel, too. It's like it's hard to offer a social criticism of the time then, of that is relevant for time now, set in the time then. Now, uh, Lucas Ney maybe has a different level of success with that than Mendez does in this script, but I, I, I think that it what Mendez has set out to do is to make you laugh and revel in the joy of wordplay, of ridiculousness, of silliness, and that in doing that, he's quite successful. Yeah, and and one of the tools that I think uh, leans into that assessment that Mendez deploys is the use of anachronism. Um, There's all sorts of, like, contemporary... Like, yes, yes, the play is set in 10 years later, Victorian or Edwardian uh, England. Um, but there's all sorts of there's references to Beyonce songs. There's references to Lord of the Rings in there, just like blatant ones. Um, there's there's all sorts of references to to, to, to kind of contemporary things. There's reference like there's the, the scene with Chausable tied to the chair is another great example, because eventually they ex- Chausable is uh, in the script 
uh, specifically called to be a double cast with Merriman, who is the servant of the house. And in the final scene, amidst all the other shenanigans, there's the scene where Chasuble's tied up to the chair and Jack calls off stage for Merriman. And all the characters have this, uh, moment <laughs> of, wait, <laughs> the guy who's playing Merriman is tied to this chair, can't get off stage to play Merriman. <laughs> and so it eventually just comes to the point where I think Gwendolyn says, well, you see, the problem is <laughs> Merriman is currently engaged in a double cast and cannot come into the room right now. And then they spend like a half page justifying why Merriman can't come into the room because of this double cast and what double cast actually means. So it's this very self-aware, very fourth kind of fourth wall breaking without directly talking to the audience. But uh, very, very, uh, yeah, almost absurd level in some of those scenes of like breaking the, the convention that we're in. Yeah, and absurd you mean colloquially rather than in its like artistic yes. sensibility. It's just like some of the situations are so ridiculous that they seem sort of absurd. And and that I that is part of the intent, which I feel like I feels important to keep saying. Uh to to jump off of your your comment about the way that the play breaks the fourth wall, uh there is a review from Time Out New York in the back of my script, and this is just a, an excerpt from it. Mendez's script weaves a lattice of clever word play and has great fun blowing up and rebuilding the fourth wall. Barely pausing to inhale, the fine cast reels off Mendez's verbiage with a plum in accents whose tongue-in-cheek snootiness is perfectly matched to the wry smile that Mendez flashes at Wild. So this, this sense in which this play is aware of the audience in the room and aware that the audience in the room is a different audience than would have seen the original productions of Wilde's work. So there is reference, there is illusion, there is mocking of the original Wilde play, but also all of those things towards the contemporary audience. Like, I do think that Mendez, to some degree, makes fun of his contemporary audience as well. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. The, 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 the way that, um, that we're kind of suckered into some of these jokes along with the other characters, um, kind of creates a little bit of a culpability, um, but also a wondering of like, how often do we believe that we're pulling off something truly clever? Um, <laughs> but, but, but aren't in fact, like, like the degree to which what <laughs> one of the, one of the funnest things Oh, kind of ironies maybe or just like just like uh pure comedy things is that jack and algernon fall for just literally their play it's not even it's not even masked at all a couple of earnests show up and they're just like yeah this makes sense it's such a common name and so so there there is this kind of delightful uh wink and nudge that welcomes us into the moment as well yeah, I also want to point out from that review there the phrase barely pausing to inhale. And then yeah, another yeah, review yeah. in the back of the script from mytheater.com that talks about the rapid fire writing. At the very beginning of the script, one of the author notes or the playwright notes, and actually, let me just celebrate Mendez. He's, he does write playwright's note instead of author's note. Yeah, well done. Yeah, yeah. You're a playwright. <laughs> you're, you may also be an author, but not for this work. Uh, all that to say, <laughs> the note is the play should move quickly. Now, this is a feature of farce. It's a feature of comedy of manners. It's a feature of this kind of witty method of script writing. It moves at a sort of breakneck speed. The, the jokes clip and fly at you because, in truth, if you spend too long with them, the, the, the story doesn't quite hold up to scrutiny. There are things that would fall apart if it did not move at the pace in which it needs to move. And so that is a, a feature that Mendez does incredibly well. But he also pays it off incredibly well in one moment late in the script. Um, the, the whole gang has come back from the club to the house. Again, remember that Jack and Algernon and the two Ernests, who are actually Gwendolyn and Cecily, and the inspector and BB have all come from the club basically to see if Gwendolyn and Cecily are having an affair or if they're just sitting quietly at home like nice young wives should. That's the perspective of the men in the play, not mine, to be clear. Right. <laughs> and so... 
they've shown up and they've discovered that Gwendolyn and Cecily are not there. Oh no, they're having an affair. How terrible. And uh, Gwendolyn and Cecily, dressed as Ernest and Ernest, have realized that they need to pull off a costume change disguise Scooby-Doo-like trick in order to make this thing work. So they've gone off stage to do the first big costume change that is going to become the major bit for the rest of the play. Them changing back and forth between being Ernest and between being Gwendolyn and Cecily. And so they've gone off stage to do this and then uh, they start, uh, the, the, the characters left on stage start to talk about the uh, their marriages. Then there is this stage direction. An unbelievably long uncomfortable silence. And then the characters, seemingly out of boredom or just uncomfortability, start talking about the weather, talking about yeah. how it's foggy around here. I never thought that this fog is foggy. Curious. I never thought it that way. It's one of the characters' lines. And then the stage <laughs> direction, they wait a really, really long time. I mean, a really, really long time. Then the conversation comes back around to fog and the nature of fogginess. And that, that little section ends with Miss Prism saying, yes, it's quite natural to talk about the weather during momentary lapses in conversation. Then you get this stage direction again. They all agree and then wait and wait and wait until Cecily and Gwendolyn enter relief all around. So Mendez has set up this incredibly high-speed comedy. Words fly. Actions fly. There's barely a break for anything in the whole script until you get to the first moment in which the major comic device of the play starts to come unraveled. Can Cecily and Gwendolyn change back and forth between these different characters that they're playing efficiently enough to pull off the trick? And in that moment, the moment the comedy has been building towards... You get these incredibly long silences. And they're so long and so intrusive that the characters do this sort of modern day thing that we do, which is to start talking about the weather when we're uncomfortable. I love this for the way the silence offsets all of that speed for how funny it is even to read. And I also love it because this is one of the moments where I think the play comes closest to being a modern day comedy of air uh, comedy of manners rather right this is a little bit yeah. of a nudge at us this is what we do in moments of long uncomfortable silence right when it's you're standing around and you're talking to somebody you don't know very well and you're just kind of forced to stand and wait together what do you say oh boy the weather lately has been just crazy hasn't uh -huh. it? Yeah. oh man it's so <laughs> warm right, now, right so this is to me the moment where the play floats up closest to the original importance of being earnest yeah, yeah, kind of brings brings us a, a societal critique into view. Um, yeah, no, I, I really like that. I like I like so I like that playwright's note at the beginning, um, just because I think there would be a a danger in this play to play some of these scenes dramatically, um, or to you know like stretch out some of them or something like that. And then I think a lot of the fun of this play evaporates because the fun is this sort of fast paced back and forth witty repartee sort of uh sort of uh a vibe that vibe that it brings um and and then yeah to have that moment at the end really kind of breaks it up grounds us back into i imagine just lets us take a deep breath too um uh so so both provides a little bit of a, a societal critique but also prepares us for the fast-paced ending of this play we're just everything starts to come apart in this moment you feel it coming apart because they're off stage and you're like oh boy it's taking them longer than it, they probably want it to um so you start to feel that tension rising which then just like dominoes so beautifully to the end of the play and it, it's it's so many things at once because i think it's a it's a joke at the expense of like theater tropes too, right? I mean, the yeah. quick change is like a feature of doing theater. Yeah. Like how fast can you and a wardrobe crew get your costume changed so as to make the transition smooth, the play move on time? And, and people know that. They know the term quick change. They know that Gwendolyn and Cecily are in the middle of a quick change from these male outfits of Ernest and Ernest into... Uh, really highly complicated female garbs of the time, right? These layered dresses and petticoats and all this different stuff. And so 
there is a sense in which we are sort of laughing at the joke being made at the expense of a quick change. We're laughing at the elongated silence. We're laughing at ourselves as they start to talk about the weather. I mean, it's, it is a really nice payoff to one of the sort of performative elements that Mendez has driven in, which is the speed at which the play takes place. Yeah. Yeah. And there's so there's I I feel like like we're start we're starting to align towards the end of our time on the podcast. But there's like there's there's so many little little intricacies in this show. Um, So many ways that these that these sorts of characters and these like like we could I feel like we could spend a bunch of time on Miss Prism too. Miss Prism has an interesting kind of set up note in in the in in the character list. Um, She's kind of listed as uh, she's listed as. Miss Prism, their caretaker, slightly preoccupied by anything, everything, any age. But for this play, I have slightly played with Wilde's timeline, for she does become the romantic interest in the play, um, uh, which which is interesting because uh, at the end of Importance of Being Earnest, she she was Jack's nanny, so she's at least kind of twenty years plus, eight, you know, maybe I don't know, twelve to eighteen years, so maybe thirty to forty years Jack's senior. Um, uh, so, so yeah, it's just in- interesting to kind of note, note that riff as well. Miss Prism kind of ends up playing a pretty central role in this play as this sort of author who's kind of caught between all the different people who's lost the children, who is, uh, becomes the, uh, becomes or falls in love with Inspector Franco Rainier, which is another, has another critique of marriage hidden in it as well as they kind of quickly fall in love and get proposed or get, get engaged. Um, so, so yeah, it's, there's, there's all sorts of little avenues to focus focus on in this play that make it just a uh just a really fun tangle to watch uh come out on stage and amidst all of the quick working jokes the sort of ridiculous situations i do think you get some really interesting exchanges too this is from early in the play cecily and gwendolyn are sort of bemoaning their marriages gwendolyn says indeed it's not at all it being marriage it's not at all like writers depict cecily the writers do a lovely job describing marriage i believe it's because they're altogether completely miserable at them gwendolyn writers never write reality why who wants to read reality cecily that's why we have new newspapers. Gwendolyn, precisely. We wrap fish and clean windows with reality. Have you ever seen people keep newspapers on their bookshelves? No one wants to keep a bookshelf full of reality. It would be exceedingly depressing. I mean, I, th- I think that's a lovely exchange of lines, a lovely kind of subtle metaphor, dig being taken at, at certain forms. And also, again, that's a moment where the play kind of rises into that comedy of manners zone where there's this sort of societal, like, how do we treat newspapers? Newspapers are the sort of form of just like the facts of what are going on in the world. And what do we do with newspapers? We clean our windows with them. You know, we turn them into to kindling to start our fires. We we do not treat them like books uh, in the same way. And, and, and Mendez makes a sort of point about that. I don't know exactly how correct the point is, but it, it's an interesting metaphor for thinking about how our society treats like fact and news, like the sort of reality versus the stories that we tell about reality. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, which is uh, kind of brought round again and brought home by Gwendolyn at the end of the play and her kind of, puck monologue she says um yet our sincerity fine legit it's all rhyming so here we go for laughter is i'm not (laughs) lying in times of darkness unifying and as you brexit through these doors into a dying earth with endless wars remember we have brexit uh uh uh-huh remember we have played our part to bring the best out of your hearts so so this notion that laughter that shared communal laughter um, is is uh, fundamentally different and thus uh, different than the news, certainly, that it is something worthwhile all on its own. And not only worthwhile, but something that can change the way uh, the way you interact with the world and by extension change the world um, is is a significant portion of what this play is trying to do in this in, in just getting to laugh for two hours straight together. Right, and and so you you just made a, a quip about the fact that the ending monologue is rhyming, and the rhyming is a really good example of that. I think it, it, the <laughs> whole second act, and you in your summary you described, is like in this rhyming couplets format because the rules of the cl- gentleman's club that Jack and Algernon are are 
that the second act takes place in, that's their gentleman's club, is that you have to rhyme. And that, that's one of those things that, like, doesn't hold up to a lot of scrutiny. I actually don't really love it, to be honest with you. But it's <laughs> it's a, a comic device that is employed to sort of say this situation is ridiculous. These characters are ridiculous. Your job here is not to make much of their motives or their objectives. Your job is to laugh at them. So here are these rhyming couplets that are, they sort of feel like you're supposed to laugh at them, right? Right? You feel like you're in a, a Moliere all of a sudden. And the way that the rhyming couplets function is to set up jokes, right? Punchlines happen in the way a rhyme works or doesn't work. And there's lots of great there's lots of great Easter eggs that lean us into that direction that we know we're not supposed to take this seriously just in the writing of the play uh, like like Easter eggs for the reader to read stuff that the audience would never read like the character descriptions have uh, they the way the character descriptions line up accents for the characters you have uh, Gwendolyn British accented Cecily British accented um, uh, Miss Prism accented in the British tongue Lady Bracknell. <laughs> accented in the mother tongue of Elizabeth the first and the second Jack Worthing accented in Victoria's tongue, etc. Uh, all these different ways at Algernon accented in the Isle of Britain. Um, all of these different ways to say they have British accents. Um, <laughs> so, so it's, it's, it's full of these kind of delightful Easter eggs, delightful, uh, uh, kind of tips of the hat to let the production team, as well as eventually the audience know that to take this play seriously is not the intent <laughs> of, uh, uh, or not to, seriously to, to, uh, to, to, to take it seriously to the point that you don't just get to laugh at these characters <laughs> is not the intent of this play. Yeah, I, I agree. I think that's probably all the time we have to talk about this script today. It's nice to be back to a longer format and be able to dive just a little more deeply into these scripts and conversations. Uh, we will be back next week with a totally different play that has nothing thematically to do with this play. That's another great reason to be back from themed month back to our regular programming of a huge variety of plays and times and intents and styles and voices i can tell you because i know what next week's play is that it is nothing like this script it is the other <laughs> end of the spectrum from this play yeah, yeah, that's the delightful ride we get to go on on this podcast. It's also a delight to get to extend the conversation out to all of you, though we are at the end of our time for this particular uh, podcast episode. Uh, we'd love to keep talking about thoroughly stupid things with all of you. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at the username at NoScriptPodcast. Uh, we also have a Gmail, noscriptpodcast at gmail.com. Find us on any of those sites, but probably especially the social media sites because it allows us to have a conversation with you, but also continue to cultivate a space online for people to engage this uh, topic of reading and talking about theater. And for our patrons as well, you can also have uh, conversations on the posts over on Patreon. Find us on any of those sites. We would love to keep talking about thoroughly stupid things with you. Absolutely. It's if you great, like this episode, great, great. this conversation, this play, please uh, recommend the podcast to your family and your friends. Anybody you know that likes theater, scripts, storytelling, reading, conversations about how writers do what they do, conversations about how stories achieve what they achieve, send them our way. They can find us on Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, YouTube, and many other places besides. If you have a less technologically savvy person in your life, but they have a Facebook account to keep up with their family. That is an easy way to follow the podcast. Like us on Facebook and the new episode appears every Monday with a link for you to just click and listen right from there. We will be back next week with a very different play entirely. So until next week when we are talking about that play, I am Jackson Nikolai. I am Jacob Mann Christensen. Thanks for joining us for No Script the Podcast.